This is the CloudSec 12 step. And what we're going to be covering today is I'm going to go over a, a brief overview of cloud. I, I, I don't necessarily know what your backgrounds are with cloud, who's, who has implementations in the cloud, who's done prototyping in the cloud, or who is totally new. So I want to cover some of the overview stuff for what cloud computing is, um, go through the 12 steps, and then make some recommendations. Um, so just a quick show of hands, how many of you in the room actually are in the cloud, either personally or your company? And is that software as a service kind of thing? One hand, okay, so how many of you have a credit card? <laughs> Pretty much everybody, yeah. So everybody in here who has a credit card could be on the cloud right freaking now. It's gotten to be that easy and um, we actually got started doing cloud research. Uh, I, I've, been in, I, I've been in computers since 1987. I started coding professionally. Um, I've been an, uh, an analyst with Securus now for about three years. But before that, I was a CTO or VP of engineering at, a, at several different startups, um, some doing security products, some doing financial products in a secure fashion. Um, so that's really my background. Uh, we were contacted by the, the Cloud Security Alliance uh, about two years ago to write the, the cloud security training program. And so we've spent the better part of the last year going through different cloud models uh, and figuring out how the heck to secure them, whether it be Amazon or Rackspace or GoGrid or what have you, and writing a training curriculum. So a lot of what you're going to see today comes from that practical experience. Uh, we also run portions of our business in the cloud. Um, um, we have an Amazon account, and I use it solely for the purpose of going to Starbucks. Um, I have a free tier AMI. A set of certificates, and when I go to Starbucks, I create an encrypted VPN up to Amazon, and I can run all my sessions that way and not worry about Fire Sheep or getting sniffed or, or getting hacked. What do you think my bill per month is? Because my seven business partners and I have used this Amazon account. You turn it off tonight? No. $72. 58 cents per month. So, you know, when I, when I came up with the. <laughs> It, no, seriously, it's 58 cents a month, and that's just simply because of some of the network bandwidth. And, 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 I, and it dawned on me when I, when I was putting together the slide deck, and then the reason why I called it you know, the CloudSec 12 step is that you've got to realize that you are powerless to stop your company from going to the cloud. You will be going there. Just what type of cloud are you going to be using? You know, what is the model that you're going to be approaching it, and what portions of your services are going there? It, it's too plentiful, too elastic, um, too easy to use, and, and too cost effective. Even the government organizations I talk with are moving. And they've got tons of compliance regulations that they worry about, but they just use a different form of cloud to take care of those compliance regulations. I'll go more into that later. So what is the cloud? I mean, most of you are going to know it because you've heard about Salesforce or use Salesforce or whatnot. Um, you might use Netflix. Obviously, that's another consumer example. But you know, basically what it is is an abstraction of infrastructure. Um, the very first cloud, as I know it, came into existence because Amazon realized that and on any given day, they only needed 1% capacity, but for that Christmas week or, or month or whatever, they needed 100% you know, capacity. And so for the rest of the year, it was all wasted. So that the entire model was to abstract the infrastructure and abstract the resources and resell that to other people who could take advantage of it. And it needs to be dynamic and elastic. I need to be able to sign up for it. If I need more resources, I can scale up. If I need less, I scale back down. It should be able to do that automatically for me. Um, resource democratization. I'm not going to have an admin go out there and, and take a couple of servers and put it in a rack and reconfigure them for you. No, it's got to be elastic. It's got to be dynamic in that way that they can come in, sign up for it, um, get the resources that they need. It's a pay-as-you-go model. You use resources, you pay for them, you shut those resources down, um, you don't pay for them. So this is the NIST model for cloud computing. Um, and I'm not sure how good the, the contrast here is. There's really two things I want to I really want to point out. So I've kind of just covered the, the top piece about what the cloud is. The two pieces I want you to pay attention here are the service models and the deployment models. So the service models, software as a service, you're literally buying an application that sits out there. You you do very little except put your data in it and manage a couple configuration settings for how you're going to use it, accounts and so forth. Um, you're familiar with it, but today. Most of you, if you're here at OWASP, you're not particularly interested in that. It's the other two models I think you're going to be most interested in long term. So infrastructure as a service, um, basically you are buying infrastructure, you are assembling infrastructure just like you would in your own data center, except it's out in the cloud. And then platform as a service, 
um, and I'll go into a little bit greater detail on what that is, um, you get some additional infrastructure and applications given to you, prepackaged, all ready to go. You use their API, you use their messaging queues and so forth, um, but you are buying a platform. So in that type of model, you're really sharing the responsibilities of administration and orchestration with a provider. From varying degrees. So if your software is a service, you're touching almost none of the administrative responsibilities. Infrastructure is a service on the other end, most of them. How many people in here work for large enterprise? Oh, almost half the room. Okay. So most likely, um, you're going to be doing private. Right now, almost exclusively, the enterprises I talk to are either in a hybrid mode or in a private mode. Um, and what that basically means is that they're either contracting with a, with a major hosting provider cloud hosting provider to do a private cloud on private infrastructure, or they're doing a private cloud on public infrastructure, but it's purely segmented off through the, um, the software and the management plane um, within that hosting provider, so that nobody else can touch it with except your own internal infrastructure, and that's where we get into the hybrid model, uh, where you have your traditional IT, and it just uses some resources in the cloud to do testing, um, business analytics, um, you know, maybe, uh, um, some quick search stuff, scale it up, use the infrastructure, and then shut it back down. And then what we see most often um, in government is community. So the IRS and the Social Security Administration and some other government agency will share a private cloud infrastructure, but since their regulatory requirements are very the same as far as data privacy, um, they can share that no problem. They don't worry about the multi-tenancy issues um, that are common within public cloud infrastructure. So, what it's not, and, and I know there have been a couple high profile people in security who have said, you know, cloud computing really is just nothing more than mainframe for, you know, the 21st century. That's bullshit. Not true. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not cloud in a box. I know Oracle's trying to sell you cloud in a box, but it's not cloud in a box. Um, there are a couple reasons for that. Um, scalability, um, self-service models, um, I mean, elasticity, those are many of them. The other reason is this. This is part of the cloud. What we're going to be talking about here today is the service side of the cloud, meaning the server infrastructures that support the applications, because I'm assuming that's what you're most are interested in. But this is the other half of it. And that's not a mainframe in a box. And it's not virtualization either. Now, every single cloud provider out there uses a virtualization technology. And in fact, the measurement unit that all of the cloud provider uses is, is, is a machine unit, much like this, you know, the virtual machine image. Um, so while all the cloud providers use it, um, the cloud itself is not a virtualized box. So this is a taxonomy. Uh, Chris Hoff did this a couple of years ago. Um, if you're interested in, in the taxonomy of what each individual um, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service really involves, please go find Chris Hoff's. It's called the, uh, the Frogs Who Desired a King. It breaks down the taxonomy for cloud in a brilliant way and gives examples. Uh, here, I'm just going to kind of skim over it a little bit because I think there's some, some interesting examples. Um, you're going to be hearing a lot about, uh, about infrastructure as a service in this presentation. Examples include EC2, Amazon's EC2, Rackspace, and GoGrid. You assemble the infrastructures you need. You put machines, images, um, caching together, memory space, disk, what have you. Um, platform as a service, usually some application. Most common, what you're going to see for, for platform as a service is things like database as a service, database.com. Um, um, SQL Azure really should be considered platform as a service because it's operating system, it's database, it's application, APIs, messaging queues, and that sort of thing. Things, the infrastructure that you need to build an application on top of. And then finally, software as a service. I doubt anybody here is going to be programming for this. So. so what are the security implications? Variable control. You don't necessarily control the infrastructure, either in infrastructure as a service or definitely not in platform as a service. Variable visibility. Um, I'll give some examples of this in a minute. Variable resource availability and variable simplicity. All right, so you can't test in the same way. Why not? Um, Amazon's not going to let you pen test their site. Not going to happen. Rackspace is not going to share log files and, and application uh, logs with you because it's a multi-tenant environment. There is no span port to plug your IDS into. <laughs> I mean, so this is a virtualized network. I mean, some of it may run over a piece of physical hardware. Some of it may just be 
uh, memory cache transfers. Um, so you're, you're really limited in what you can deploy. We've, we've done security now for a long time with, with traditional IT, and we have specific models for how we deploy data collectors, how we deploy um, security solutions, um, and, and the cloud does change it. It doesn't change it radically, but everything across the cloud changes a little bit. And that's one of the problems with doing a cloud security course is that I need to cover a little bit everywhere. And so I've got a lot of slides that I'm going to go as quickly as I can. Um, please save questions to the end unless it's like burning in your mind. Um, and I'll try to take one or two, but uh, I'm going to try to keep moving along here. So you will notice today that I'm going to focus on, on PASS and, uh, and, and IS. Um, as I said, you're not programming. You're not programming SaaS environments, most likely. Um, I'm going to try to take a development-oriented view here as much as I possibly can. Um, most of these examples I'm going to give you are in Amazon EC2. It's not because that's the preferred method. In fact, I will encourage all of you to go out to Rackspace, look at OpenStack, look at the OpenStack movement. Um, a lot of you might prefer that to develop open applications. Um, it's just that EC2 was a, a little more accessible for me because I already had an account, so it was easier to get screenshots. Um, it's cheap, and, and it was just faster for me to put the slide deck together. Um, and I'll probably concentrate on public and hybrid deployments, certainly within the encryption and key management stuff. So the program itself. I'm going to start out with application security. Um, you know, all of the aspects of application security across the Nest ELC, there will be minor tweaks and changes across the board. So architecture. Um, there are things you're going to want to lever in any application you put into the cloud. It's a native service-oriented architecture. You want to be able to take advantage of that because you want the application to scale up or down and take advantage of the resources you have available. Um, but if you are Netflix and you are dispersing your application across multiple geographic zones, you've got to have something that's going to allow for federated identity um, within your own service infrastructure. You're going to be communicating with certificates. So one database server talking to a different application is going to validate itself through certificates and other, uh, and other cryptographic means. Um, and your threat and, and risk analysis is going to change because in infrastructure as a service, you still have a partner, the provider. They will be providing some services to you. And platform as a service, once again, um, they will have a big piece of the, uh, of, the, of the puzzle. They will manage that infrastructure. Uh, you will be managing the application and everything outside of that. So to kind of hammer that point home, in your traditional IT infrastructure, everything's in-house. You own everything. You shield what you need to shield, and you push out to the public what you need to push out, or with your internal organization. With infrastructure as a service, not quite the same. Um, your architecture and design is still in-house. Deployment can still be in-house. Testing, maybe, maybe not. I'll get more into that in the testing session, and then the production environment is fully externalized to the, to the cloud. Um, platform as a service, um, you know, a lot of that infrastructure is going to be owned and managed by the provider, right down to the APIs. So these trust boundaries differ in how you're going to secure your provider or, or get your provider to validate that they're giving you security. Um, you've got to work that out with them. Every provider is different. So I had a couple slides on threat modeling. I realize I don't have time to go through them all, um, but you will be threat modeling your cloud deployment about how the applications are deployed, which components component, uh, communicate with other components, um, you know, how you're going to threat model the pr a provider hack. Um, and, and these have happened. You know, cloud deployments have been hacked, or they have had failures within load balancing or other sorts of tools that are supposed to segregate and keep users in a multi-tenant environment separate. And, and they work until they don't, uh, which means occasionally they fail. So design for threats. Any application that you're going to deploy in the cloud, you need to reconsider who owns what and how it's going to be secured. Um, and this is just a basic breakdown of, of the things you want to consider for, for different types of threat. So for example, you know, uh, spoofing and tax authentication um, uh, for you know, elevation privilege authorization. And I'll dig into a little deeper in that in a couple slides. So I'd already mentioned what you can test. Um, you need to consider that. Um, it, you can't really fuzz test on a live environment that's in the cloud. And it's not feasible. The beauty of that is, though, that you can leverage uh, um, infrastructure as a, as a service to actually give yourself a private cloud and do full testing and very closely mimic a, a production environment. Um, you know, but all of these things about multi-tenancy and about different threat models, you need to take into account. 
So I think I've gone into much of that. So uh, within the slide deck, I'll put this up. But this is a kind of a handy chart about how to approach uh, some of the app, uh, application architecture issues and where to put your resources. I know it's a little bit small and hard to read, but um, we'll make the slide deck available so you can check it out uh, after the presentation. So identity and authorization. Um, there will be a couple of very good presentations, undoubtedly, on identity and authorization uh, for cloud services during the course of this week. Um, obviously, for identity, the things you're worried about is registering users, both internal and external. Um, propagation of those users, especially if you're, you're using a cloud service that it goes across multiple cloud boundaries. Um, for example, Rackspace or uh, an Amazon is going to have different deployment zones, one in the east, one in the west, one in Europe. Um, and if you want identity to, to spawn across those different uh, regional boundaries, you have to do it. That's up to you. Some of your platform as a service provider will take care of that for you automatically on the back end. Uh, user management, deprovisioning users as necessary, and auditing um, the activity of creation of accounts and so forth. Access, this is all pretty traditional stuff, right? You've seen this before. But how are you going to go about it within the cloud environment? Are you going to deploy an LDAP server? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, what we're seeing um, is that the vendors provide pretty good infrastructure for, for most basic cloud deployments. Um, you know, if you're fully in a private cloud, you can deploy traditional LDAP services, uh, Active Directory, what have you. Um, if you're in a hybrid model, meaning you're in traditional IT infrastructure, communicates through a VPN tunnel up to the cloud, you can still take advantage of what you have today and have those cloud services link in with the traditional existing IT infrastructure. That's important because that keeps your cost down too. Uh, single sign-on, this is really where a lot of the application developers I'm speaking with um, are moving and they're using things like SAML um, and, and really SAML is there to, to make sure that you can federate identity and single sign-on across a number of different environments. And so most of the applications I'm seeing nowadays built for either web applications or cloud service applications are being built with SAML in mind. And I'm not going to go into a great detail there on SAML. I'm assuming that if you're a programmer, you, you know about SAML already. Um, same thing with OAuth. Uh, once again, the ability to, to avoid having credential propagation all over the place, um, OAuth allows us to, to make an assertion and have that assertion uh, uh, be validated through, through key exchanges as opposed to sending a username and password. How many of you are here are aware that when you sign up for an Amazon or Rackspace account, you get a key, a certificate? Okay, you don't get username and password. That's important. And I'll, I'll, you'll see why in a couple slides here. So once again, options, uh, SAML is the emerging standard right now. Um, OAuth, uh, definitely um, widely used. Uh, OpenID, not recommended, not really particularly secure. It's just for ease of use. Um, Given people uh, web app access, not really secure, but convenient. And then uh, WS Federation uh, for, for, for Windows stacks. Um, one of the things that you might notice if you set up accounts on many of the providers is that, um, and it's, there's probably a bias in my slide deck here, you're going to see a lot more Linux in your Windows on any of the slides. Um, for whatever reason, when you start up a Windows account, it can take 25 or 30 minutes to spin up a Windows box in the, in the cloud. I have no idea why that is. Um, I can't figure it out. So almost all of the, the training that we've been providing has been on Linux-based systems because they come up in two or three minutes. And when you're we're running a class or you're trying to do demos or you're trying to you know spin up stuff quickly, run a test and spin it back down, that's, that's a big deal. Um, so pure bias on my part, I guess, because I'm, I'm lazy and don't want to wait around. Um, code analysis. I really had trouble putting this number four in here. Um, the reason I put it in here is that if you can't do image validation, if you can't validate the machine before you're going to deploy it, or you cannot do dynamic web application testing, really better be doing binary analysis or white box testing. Um, if you have the options of, of, of validating the stack, and, and that's later in the slide presentation too, um, it's, it's less required. <coughs> I mean, obviously, the cloud security guidance and most of the people who founded the Cloud Security Alliance recommend it. Um, but um, use your best judgment. So testing. Um, one of the things that I've been able to do is to actually use private clouds to test. 
completely mimic uh, um, an internal testing infrastructure, spin it up very quickly, run my test, pull the results down, shut the whole infrastructure down. I don't have to buy. I don't have to provision. Um, all I got to do is set it up and run it. And since it's your own private cloud, you don't have to worry about others actually getting access to it. So I strongly advise, if you're going to do testing of, of web application, do it in a private cloud. You can set it up on Amazon in public infrastructure, or you can retain, if you're in a larger company, you've got data security issues, you can uh, contract with one of the larger providers and they will segment off an, an area for you. Uh, and you can do a private cloud on private infrastructure. Um, but it is very handy to be able to move good production quality data up into the cloud, test very quickly, and get it the heck back out of there. Um, fuzzing testing is, is also possible in this type. You can do full-on dynamic testing because you're not actually testing from outside into the cloud, but you're inside your own uh, private area within the cloud. Um, but you also want to make sure that anybody that you contract with get the service level agreements. What does your vendor allow you to do? Will they allow you to do a vulnerability assessment? Will they allow you to do a partial pen test? Will they give you the results of a pen test or do some of that for you? There's lots of leeway for what you can negotiate with the cloud provider, but you have to do the work because they don't want to do it. <laughs> so, but most of them have provisions for you if you sign up for an account that they will give you some of that information. Find out what they do, find out uh, what they can do, um, figure out what the delta is and, and make plans to accommodate uh, for your own cloud infrastructure. Um, and I threw this in kind of as an example um, because some of the cloud providers allow you to do vulnerability assessment, but that's about the extent of it. Uh, they're not going to let you do fuzzing um, and a lot of other types of stress testing. So app protection, um, and I've got a couple other slides in here for some of the audience members, but uh, to start with, a lot of this is going to look like exactly what you do today. There might be a firewall. There's probably going to be a WAF. Um, there are some new technologies out there that allow you to take uh, another machine image and, or I'm sorry, uh, embed within your own stack honeypotting. So it'll leave small traces of what looks like a vulnerability. If it gets attacked, you know you're under attack and you can take countermeasures um, either through a WAF or through some other technology. Um, Firewall is inherent to the, to, the, um, to the cloud providers. So once again, service level agreement, find out what your, your uh, vendor is going to filter. If you're on infrastructure as a service, most likely you're going you're gonna to deal with this on security zone and, and IP filtering. I'll get into that more later. Um, if you're on platform as a service, um, it varies. It varies from provider. And I threw this in there for one of our audience members. Because um, this is what we have been seeing in most of the literature, right? Firewalls and SSL, firewalls and SSL. Not so. Um, this is not going to protect you. So let's move into information security. Um, this is a piece of guidance that we had created for the Cloud Security Alliance. It doesn't really work. <laughs> but what it does do a good job of it is, is kind of dividing up all the different use cases for data. Where is it? How is it used? Where does it go? How does it get stored? And the reason why I actually put it in here um, is both to let you know that it doesn't work, but also it, uh, in almost every single step, encryption is the, is the core value. Um, so you're going to be using encryption a lot for data storage, um, for data migration, what have you. Um, you might choose to encrypt at a number of different levels. Um, one of the biggest threats that we ran across when, when creating the, the, the guidance or the, the, the training class was we realized that if you're taking a backup in the cloud, it is trivial. You log in, you make a snapshot, it's done in seconds creates a copy of your entire infrastructure or your entire database or, or just a volume, whatever you want. But it's also trivial to press another button and have that public. And then press another button and 30 seconds later it's moved to a different cloud. You could quite literally, if you have a compromise, um, lose your entire infrastructure in a matter of seconds in a scalable, high-performance, elastic way. Um, <laughs> so, um, in, encryption is your friend. Um, the question is where um, you're going to do it. Um, obviously, you're going to do it if you're moving data up to the cloud. So there are, there are SSL capabilities um, for every single cloud provider that's out there. 
Um, how you enforce rights management, probably going to be through certificates. Um, the data that you leave there can be stored in a number of different ways. The two ways we see most commonly, you know, like a true crypt volume um, encryption um, or transparent encryptions like a, like a Vormetric on the, on the file system side or like a, a built into some of the databases like IBM and, and Oracle on the database side. And then once again, um, like many things on the internet, uh, you know, incriminating photos and what have you, um, data lives in the cloud a really long time. It's redundant because if Amazon loses a server, they want to make sure you don't lose data. So there are multiple copies out there. And they do a great job of you know, shredding old disks and so forth. But just to be sure, um, a lot of the people we're talking to in enterprises are looking at crypto shredding as opposed to data, um, you know, um, eradicating data through um, scrubbing disks. So they simply, at some point in time, will throw away the keys on older data. That's, the, that's becoming the security model. Um, so once again, where you can actually deploy um, application layer is probably the most secure. Um, you're not worried about where the keys are, are going to be used or stored um, as much, and it's much easier to be able to control what gets encrypted with which key at a very granular level. It's also a pain in the ass um, to code. So what we see most often, as I said, transparent forms of encryption, either at the, uh, the file system layer or at the database layer. Uh, and once again, simple volume, are, uh, simple volume encryption. And, and these are the types of things we, we normally will, will teach in class because it's relatively easy to set up a volume encryption, test it out, and get it to work. Um, every single cloud provider I've been on so far, it works beautifully. So where to put the keys? Um, this is a problem. So you'll notice that a lot of this presentation is making the assumption that you guys as developers are going to be out there prototyping applications with or without the support of your organization. So you're probably going to do things quick, fast, and easy. And we see a lot of developers put some code out, test it, uh, and they leave the key on the volume. So it's right in the machine image, and they take a backup because they're putting code out there and they want to make sure that they've, they've got a backup. Well, wherever that image goes, the key goes with it. So if somebody else starts up another image of what you've stored out there, they have the key and can get into the volume. So it may sound trivial, but it's actually a really common problem that the key gets stored right on, on the disk. So you want to look at some sort of a key management uh, um, service. Um, your, the, the infrastructure providers will actually have some key services for you that are built in. Um, the, the platform as a service providers usually have APIs for this. You can use uh, key servers, um, commercially available key servers. Um, some, um, so most of the HSMs nowadays are, are setting up APIs so that you can continue to leverage through your own VPN um, your existing HSM services for key management and then simply link them up to your cloud services, once again leveraging existing infrastructure. Um, or there are other um, um, companies that are producing pre-built AMIs um, with, the, so the machine image already has the key server set up. If you bring it up, um, you tell it which instances are valid, and it does all the, the key negotiation for you. And this is important because you might bring up nine machine images, but only four of them are valid. So who is really supposed to be talking to the volume? Who is supposed to be getting keys? Not every single image that comes up is valid. So I think uh, Trend Micro, and uh, there's at least like one or two other vendors out there that have that sort of thing. If you can build a key management as an independent service. And then of course, there are other vendors who you know provide software uh, key management you can install and use as, as normal, but you will need to cordon off that virtual machine image uh, and, and then build in your own application logic that uh, secures uh, new images being brought up. So a couple uh, encryption architectures do a little bit of a review. Um, you know, you can move this stuff around and how these pieces communicate with one another purely defined by you. And this is the simple one that we normally teach. It's quite literally a, a private instance for the key server, um, public IP for the, uh, the app server, and then somewhere on the back end on the private uh, storage piece. So this would be app layer encryption. I put it up here because I figured some of you would be doing that. Uh, monitoring. Hmm. Where do I deploy the IPS? Where do I do database monitoring? Um, how does the SIM fit in here? 
Yeah, the, the, there's no good answer, and it varies depending upon which, which provider you're going to, um, what's actually going to be available. So uh, what we see for monitoring technologies that go out um, to secure infrastructure, to secure data, we have application firewalls, very common. We're seeing a lot of database activity monitoring. Um, file activity monitoring, especially for SharePoint that moves up into the cloud. Um, data loss prevention a little bit, usually at different junctions or, or, or nodes between that will look for specific content that's coming through. Most of that's regex filtering, but can also do other types of uh, um, hash comparisons and looking for sensitive data. Um, usually I'm seeing this now, people are pulling DLP on the data that moves up into the cloud so they can categorize it figure out whether the sensitive information is, and then figure out how they're going to secure it once it gets up there. Not the best model, but at least they've got some sort of an idea of what they moved into the cloud. And then um, and various other service monitors, monitoring uh, database services, application services, um, deploying your, your own sensors for, for uh, event collection. And what's different about the monitoring technologies in the cloud is that they're running on virtualized images. Most of the providers cannot take the stock product that they have and just move it to the cloud. It doesn't usually work very well because the data collectors need very specific things from the operating system. And so they've all had to port or change the, the data collectors that they install on the virtual machines. That's one of the big differences. Most of the early cloud uh, monitoring technologies, they just literally threw all their stuff onto an AMI, um, put it out there for you to use, but you had to spend hours actually configuring the thing and getting it to work. Not such a good model. So we're finally starting to see the security vendors you know, port, their, port their data collectors, uh, actually configure their images, and, and, uh, and, and make these actually a little bit more cloud accessible. So here's some, uh, a couple of examples. And once again, this is not an endorsement of any particular technology. This is just kind of, I want to make sure you guys are aware of what's out there and available. So with GoGrid right now, within the load balancers, they've actually deployed F5 as a web application firewall for you. And you could do some custom configuration on this, but it's been built into the infrastructure. Um, you have a, you know, a more traditional kind of a SaaS model where you are do, just doing a DNS redirect um, to be able to do WAF and DLP. Um, so you can just bolt this on anywhere and then redirect the stuff back in your own private or public cloud. Um, pretty much for uh, infrastructure as a service, an agent-based deployment for database security and database activity monitoring. Um, and the last one down here, uh, pre-built AMIs. Um, once again, you're, you're basically shoving the monitoring piece into an AMI, configuring it to come up and monitor. You just need to basically tell it which, app, which applications and, and, and which instances you want monitored. So the third and final portion of the 12-step program, uh, infrastructure. So this is actually, uh, this is one that, that took me by surprise. It was two black hats back that um, one of the presentations actually showed um, how easy it was to put a rogue infected Amazon machine image out onto Amazon. Anybody can do it anytime. But the key was to getting somebody to use it. So when you go into Amazon or you go into Rackspace and there's public images out there, they're listed. They're listed in the order of popularity and use. So there were literally, they were writing small scripts to raise the popularity of their rogue application up and people would just grab them thinking they were safe. Not a good freaking idea, because you're basically launching pre-built malware, pre-built botnet within your infrastructure. It's really important that if you're going to take an AMI, um, that you find a good one, that you go directly to Red Hat or you go directly to, to the OS provider and get it. Um, as I said, many of the security vendors now have prepackaged this stuff so you can get a clean AMI. If you can additionally get them to do some sort of white box, you know, code analysis and verify what's actually in that thing, um, what some of the vulnerabilities might be, uh, that would be an additional benefit, not always possible. So hardening the stack is, is, is really one of the important uh, pieces that you want to do. Um, when you go out, you'll notice that um, you're going to have the AMIs that you've created, you've configured, you've tuned, and you've saved out here. Um, most of you, since you've never used this, you're going to come out here and grab a community AMI, and that's where the problem arises. But once again, you can contact almost every single vendor nowadays has got uh, an Amazon machine image or some sort of a rack space image. Deployment stack hardening. So 
Um, one of the cool things about all of the infrastructure service providers and some of the platform service providers is that you can automatically patch and pre-configure any single image that gets launched. They have right on the launch screen the place to tell it what to do. So you just give it a script. And it's that simple. Now I've got both of these enabled here, not one commented out, but I mean you can either update or upgrade to a new version automatically prior to launch. Right there. And you know it happened because you can see the launch screen when it does. In fact, we put messages of the day in there to tell us if the thing actually succeeded or not, so we know if we got successfully patched, successfully updated, right there in the console. It's a very handy way to make sure that as your infrastructure moves forward and expands and contracts, it actually stays up to date as far as patching goes. In addition to that, you can do the same thing with configuration. So for this particular one, what we're doing is we're setting up a MySQL instance to be used on, a, uh, on, a, on an encrypted drive. Um, so we're just resetting um, where some of the MySQL infrastructure is. We're using it in the WordPress environment, so we're just moving it over to an encrypted volume, changing some stuff around, and then relaunching it. So we, we can quite literally harden the installation right there at startup time. Very handy. Security zones, step 11 of the 12-step program. Um, these are a really cool feature. Just think about this as your, your, your network layer. And security zones are basically um, a virtual definition of, of what can communicate in your virtual space. This is how you define uh, certain areas where an application might reside or a database might reside or a cluster of applications may reside. And then what protocols and what users can go in and out of that. So security zones really define how data flows. It will tell you where you're going to be exposed, your data is going to be exposed, and where your applications will be exposed. So, for example, um, you can set up a security zone with web server and with some other application services, uh, define which ports come in uh, and from what locations. You can define when to give public IP addresses and when not. Um, so if you only want one server in here to be able to communicate with other servers in here, you don't give it access to any sort of DNS services or external lookup capabilities. Um, once again, you can define the ports. So remember, as I said earlier today, when I go to Starbucks, I create a VPN connection up into my Amazon AMI. And that's the only port that that machine image is allowed to do, and it's only going to take one certificate, mine. I can do this from anywhere, but nobody else can. So it's a very, very handy way of, of setting up the, the network security very quickly, just a couple lines um, from in the console of any one of those service providers. And here might be a little bit clearer example of what I'm talking about. So in one of the examples that we give when we, when we train for this, uh, we set up WordPress, we set up MySQL, uh, we only allow them to communicate over one port. And the database is inaccessible except for anything over, except for over 20, port 22 from my local machine in my house. WordPress instance is publicly available or maybe only available inside my company, what have you. Um, but this is how I, I secure um, the basic network infrastructure. And so this gets rid of a lot of need for, for other types of, of security. And then I can really tailor um, um, whatever monitoring software that I've got to, to check for threats. And then finally, management plane. Um, as I started the presentation out with, I mean, this is just one of the things that we found to be the, the, the biggest problem. The management plane is so freaking powerful that if it is compromised, you can do anything. I mean, all of the data can go. The entire infrastructure can be duplicated and then brought up somewhere else. It's uh, um, quite stunning. So kind of an example of uh, the way that um, the management plane infrastructure for, for database.com, I just pulled this off because I thought I'd give a pretty clear idea of what, what they have available. All of these things are, are available and configurable right from, the, right from the management console. And unless you set up the security zones and the availability and issue certificates to individual users to kind of segregate this, one person's got it all. That's usually the way that I see it. Unfortunately, that's the case. Um, so 
in your planning of how you're going to deploy, it's not just a security zone issue, but you need to figure out how you're going to actually realize separation of duties. That goes for Google App Engine as well. That goes for Amazon. Um, if you allow one admin user to have every single access right or a couple of admins all on the same console, you're setting yourself up for failure. You don't want to put production data out there if you haven't done the proper separation of duties on the, on the management plane. So that's basically the 12 steps. I just want to kind of wanted to throw um, a few more things out there, cost considerations. Um, you can design your application to scale without having all the hardware available. It is naturally a service-oriented architecture. Um, consider that when you are building it, the, the resources are not an issue. They're not a problem. Um, but shut down what you don't use. As I said, we're, we're 58 cents a, a month for our, for our little basic account that we use. And it, it, as long as we don't leave volume sitting up and running, as long as we don't leave other servers sitting up and running test servers, then we get like a 17 18 $20 bill. Um, so you know, shut down what you don't use, build the elasticity into your configuration scripts um, so that your application can grow and shrink as needed and you don't get overcharged. Um, but go out and use it. I mean, it's, it's really actually quite fascinating. It's, it's kind of fun to do. Some of the OpenStack stuff is really interesting. And so um, go give it a try. Go spin up a, go spin up a drive and, and encrypt it and see what the certificates look like and see how you might manage the certificates. <clears throat> shut it down. You need to build for a buck. He learned about the cloud. That's it.